This is a podcast from Partnerships for Wellbeing. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Ways to Wellbeing from Partnerships for Wellbeing here in Inverness. I'm still flying solo as presenter at the moment during this holiday season, but for all you Nicola McKenzie fans out there, don't worry, she will be back soon. However, I do get the chance to indulge myself by uh, finally tracking down a guest that I've been, I think, chasing around the globe for some months now. He's known as one of the most sought-after opera directors uh, in the world. He's a multi-talented, multilingual man about the world. But more than that, he's an old school friend of mine. Welcome, Paul Curran, to Ways to Wellbeing. Hi, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. Thank oh, thank you very much for joining us, Paul. So, our previous guest uh, was from just along the corridor from our office. You're a wee bit further away today. Tell us where you are. Uh, I'm in Venice right now. So, having had two and a half years of no work at all, I'm at my work <laughs> in Venice, <laughs> of all places. Which I keep so every day. I walk to the theatre and I walk along canals and. Beautiful places, seeing beautiful things with jasmine bushes smelling all over the place, thinking, what a lucky bugger. <laughs> so, <laughs> could be a lot worse going to your work. Yeah, it's not a bad day's work, is it? No, uh, yeah. uh, although that's minimising, it, it must be hard. Does the travelling kind of um, wear on you at, at times? Do you, do you get bored of it? Absolutely. And the older you get, I remember when I was a kid, you know, when we were at school together, I, I was always sort of, you know, r- desperate to travel the world and see things and experience things and that was my greatest wish and then you know as I've got older you must be very careful when you rub that lamp what you ask the genie for because she might just give it to you and then you've got to deal with it but it has to be said waking up at four o'clock in the morning getting in water taxis or planes or whatever whatever as you've got to do does get tedious and you know 12 14 hour journeys to San Francisco or New York or whatever as I'm going it sounds terribly glamorous. It's a real pain in the backside a lot of the time because it's exhausting. And going through, you know, uh, just constantly going through uh, uh, security and all of that. And if you're a traveler that travels re- travels regularly, like me, you're always getting stopped and for special screening, special questioning. That just gets tiring, especially when you're, you know, you're not doing it once a month, once a year in your holidays. I'm doing it nearly every week or month. Well, yeah, I, I can appreciate anything that you do for your work. The, the, the glamour of it fades uh, after a while. I have to say, Paul, I've been following your career for, for many years now. I mean, as I mentioned, we were we were in the school orchestra together. We kind of lost touch for quite a few years. Then you suddenly emerged onto the scene. I think I first noticed you when you got the job at the, uh, was it the Norwegian State Opera? The Norwegian uh, National Opera, yes. Norwegian National Opera. Yeah. And then I've been following you since then, and I often thought, because the thing I remember about you at school is you had that love of learning languages, yeah. and to see you travelling the world in uh, uh, as an opera director, I often thought it'd be a great, you'd be a great character in a spy novel. <laughs> you know, it'd be a great cover story, opera director, but it's really an international actually, spy. Yeah, <laughs> actually international spy. So yeah, if there's anything... Good. Anything you'd like to reveal now with the Secret Services listening, um, please do so. Yes, I think the Tory government needs to stand by. <laughs> I've been working <laughs> on it for several years. <laughs> but I can use you in my next book, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, please do. Now, now tell us, as I, as I mentioned, we were at school together. Um, music um, played a big part in, our, in both our lives, but more so you, I, I reckon. Uh, how important was schooling and and the music lessons for you in those days? Well, I mean, there were two things. We we grew up in Easter House in the seventies, and it was you know certainly not the happiest or most carefree of places uh, with unemployment around and all of that. For me, both music and education, I very early on, and I sincerely mean this, I saw them as the key to getting out and to moving forward somewhere. So I was, I was, I was quite determined that I would not spend the rest of my days there, and I wanted, I wanted to explore the world a lot more. Music was a great love and a great passion, and it was a great sort of asylum for me. It was my headspace where I could get lost in the skill of it and the creation of it. 
and I didn't know. I suppose I didn't know then that it was it was going to basically follow me all my life. I was I was always going to be in music, and very grateful for that. So I'm enormously grateful to uh, our music teacher back then, Helen Kerr, who instilled this great love of music. And also, Helen did another thing. She made me realize music is not only about about listening and appreciating all that. It's hard work. It's bloody hard work. And she was the first person never heard used the term we're working um and that's something that i've i've sort of kept with me is that it is hard work and we need to we that create it have to work hard to, to produce it so that anybody else can simply just enjoy it so it was always my key the languages were the same thing i was fascinated as a kid with other cultures i was fascinated to know people led different lives in different ways i knew there was sort of you know somewhere beyond the number, what was it called, number 41 bus route. That had to be something else. Um, and that's why I learned the languages. Curiously, you know, it was interesting back then. Remember, the chemistry was scheduled at the same time as Italian. And I was told I was a boy and I'd be doing chemistry. And I said, oh, certainly not. I'll be doing Italian. And uh, that head, mental headmaster we had would come into the chemistry class, uh, the Italian class, and hold me out and take me to the chemistry class. Well, I mean, he needn't have bothered because I was like a cat. I just went straight back to the to the, the Italian class. Um, it's extraordinary. Here I am. Here I am doing my thirty eighth production in Italy, and the <laughs> most I've ever needed of chemistry. And I've nothing against people learning chemistry. It's a very, <laughs> very, very laudable thing to do. But here I am in Italy talking to seventy two chorus and fluent Italian. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> thank you. So Better school for just getting fed up with me and letting me do it. <laughs> and uh, anyway, you're mixing your own potions in a way these days. Yeah. Tell us, tell us what a, a, an opera director brings to to a, a production. I mean, at the moment you're doing Peter Grimes, yes. uh, in, in opera terms, very modern uh, yeah. in, in terms of 1945. Like, yeah. 1945. Um, there's been multiple stagings of it over the years, some on a beach, you know, and, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, in a courtroom setting, all of that. How does it work? Do you, are you asked to take on the job and then you have a think about it, what you can bring to it? Well, the first thing that happens is either through your reputation or through your agent or both, um, a company will say, we are planning this piece, we'd like you to, to come and do it. Or often if I'm somewhere... You know, now I'm very old. Um, they'll say, we want you to come back. What would you like to do or what, what can we discuss? So basically, the company asks me. I will then hire a designer uh, who will be a set and, and costume designer, often two designers, one for sets, one for costumes, or in this case, Gary McCann, who does both. And um, then I'll also hire a lighting designer and very much these days a video designer. So once I've done that, I then conceptualize the piece. So what does the director do? The director is the chief storyteller. And we use, we use the soloist, the chorus, the technique, meaning the lighting, the design, the everything, to tell the story of Peter Grimes. So what I've always sought to do is, I, you know, opera is a mix of things. It's, it, it's a bit like, you know, a certain beer advertisement back in the 70s and 80s where it said, reaches the parts other beers cannot reach. I think that's very much what opera does. Is it's a very emotional um, uh, art form that can make you laugh, cry, get enraged, get, get annoyed, move you deeply all at the same time. So because music really, really does get into the emotional state of, of, of the mind. So principally, my job is I'm the guy that's telling the story with all means possible, trying to get the story across. And the big of the opera, Peter Grimes, is perhaps one of the biggest pieces I've ever done in my life. So here we have 72 chorus, 15 soloists, uh, 15 extras, offstage band. It's, it's an enormous undertaking. Um, but I've been doing it for 30 years now, and I love every second of it. Very lucky. And and Peter Grimes, I mean, I, I do not in any way pretend to be an expert in opera, although I do think we both went to the, the same first opera together. What? Um, yes. That's right, yes. I what still have the... By Alban Berg. That's right. Do you believe I still have the ticket stub for that? Really? Oh, my God, you've got to take a picture and send that. <laughs> I, will, I will do. I'm a terrible hoarder. Um, but when I was looking into Peter Grimes, it immediately jumped out to me as how contemporary the theme yeah. was. This is a man 
who is subject to gossip and rumour and accused of horrible things and is basically cancelled by his kind of local community. Yes. And I thought, well, isn't that where the world is at the moment? Absolutely. And it's a, it's a piece about conjecture. It's a, a piece about, as you say, gossip. And, and he's definitely guilty. But what's interesting in Britain's piece is there is not one word that would confirm his guilt. And I think it's part of what the director does is to make sure that you're not showing physically, other than uh, the, the, the words themselves, but physically you're not showing that this is that this guy is guilty, that he's a child murderer is, is the main charge. The interesting thing, of course, is who is guilty in this piece of society itself? Because we're talking about a just pre-industrial revolution um, workhouse system where little children are abused into work, 12 14 hour days basically for free it's basically slave labor and that's what grimes uses as uh, one of the little boys that helps him because little kids like down the mines they could get in small places and they could fix the nets so the interesting thing is that nobody in this borough nobody in this village ever discusses are they guilty for supporting this enslavement of children that seems to just go by the by so again it's a piece that i think is about extraordinary cancel culture because they just want rid of them and indeed that's what happens but it's also about the hypocrisy of society that allows such a thing and feels so morally superior to everybody because they think they're right there's a, a methodist minister in it who's a drunkard and a lech who's all over the girls and causes two fights in the pub but he's the one that's holding up the bible saying you know repent 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 so it's, it's an absolutely fascinating piece and britain by the way wrote it in, in a bit of a rage and it was because of how he was treated. He went to America in 1939, and he was treated extremely poorly by the British establishment and press. They said he was a coward. In fact, he was a conscientious objector. And he got blocked in America for three years. He, you know, the North Atlantic was completely blocked by U-boats, so nobody could get across the Atlantic. And by the time he got back, he was treated extremely poorly and unfairly, and his response was to write Peter Grimes. So it's a piece uh -huh. that's written out of great passion and great injustice, and as I said, a piece where he shows what goes on, but doesn't make any judgment on it at all. I, I, one of my challenges in this piece, I've done a piece several times, is I want the audience to leave in a way with more questions than they entered with. Mm -hmm. I think that's more interesting. It, it made me wonder if your job makes you look at the world in a certain way, whether you see event in operatic terms you know there's you think to yourself my goodness this story this news story has all the elements of, of an opera i think you've got a different take on that I, I think it depends on what you mean by operatic i mean does operatic mean over the top or just heightened emotion or whatever mm. i'd say easily the war in ukraine and russia's aggression going on right now is operatic because it's inexplicable it's completely over the top, utterly excessive. It's it's outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. That is operatic, and a lot of operas deal with, with war. I think what opera does is opera deals with extremities, it deals with the extremities of the human condition, and it does so, unlike a play, it does so in the extremity of emotion because it sort of forces you to see stories in intellectual and in emotional terms. By getting you involved, you sit there holding your breath because the music gets to you. The music, the, the film industry, for example, would never exist without opera. The film industry saw in uh, opera at the beginning of um, Hollywood, saw the emotional life that Puccini and Wagner and all that were bringing to stories. And of course, the film industry, what was the first thing that accompanied the film? It was always somebody at a piano or a or a, often a full orchestra, but it was a piano or an organ. So when was the last time you saw a movie that didn't have a soundtrack? Mm -hmm. Almost never, unless it was some small art house thing. Uh, so that's basically what opera is. Opera is exactly that emotional life that makes us see, see stories. And the stories are of human extremities, love, hate, friendships, loathing, murder, loneliness, all those sorts of things. Yeah. They're just heightened stories. Um, so I don't think I see the world through operatic terms. I think opera sees the world through its own terms. Yeah. I think because Peter Grimes has that kind of courtroom element to it, it made me think immediately of 
uh, the recent story of Amber Heard and, and Johnny Depp and this clash of personalities and and strange thing about very serious subjects almost descending into farce at, at, at times. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, one of the things I do in the, in the, in fact, it's interesting, it's an inquest, it's not, not a trial at mm-hmm. the beginning because there's only questions being asked, there's no accusation made. And that's kind of the interesting thing with the, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard thing is, of course, we then become the peanut gallery. We, looking through media, looking through TV and all of that, we start watching this and making up our minds and, and having opinions based on moment-to-moment evidence, which is what happens in the prologue of Peter Grimes. What's fascinating is, of course, um, I, I get the, the chorus very involved in it. So apart from the bits they sing, they comment all the way through it. There's a lot of noise from the from the chorus because I think that's what they're doing. That's what we do sitting watching the TV. Oh, she's going hysterical. Oh, my God, he's a monster, blah, blah, blah. Um, but fascinatingly, I think that's that's what an opera can show up. It, it can get you involved in that. So I think a piece like Peter Grimes has enormous contemporary uh, resonance in that we are now at a time where media has never been so fast. It's never been so obvious. And quite frankly, I don't know that it's helping our mental health. I think we have a little, a lot too much information to deal with. I think we should go to the theatre for those moments. I don't think we should have it 24-7 on here. Yeah. I'm, I'm very happy to get rid of it. Well, speaking of health, Paul, when I suggested you as a, as a great guest for this podcast on well-being, I was telling the story, and I only vaguely know it of you, that you originally um, went into ballet, and then you suffered some kind of injury, yeah. and that led you in a different direction with your career, which has, of course, been enormously successful. And I found... Yeah. That and I'm giving that story in a nutshell, but I found it enormously inspirational in terms of uh, it wasn't the end of a dream for you; it was the beginning of something new. Very much so. I mean, you're absolutely spot on with what happened. I got interested in dance. My parents were not happy. They threw me out. I was 16. I went to London. I ended up in Helsinki studying. Had a dance career. Got injured. My hip came out of the socket in a show in Germany. And at that point, I remember thinking. What the hell do I do next? What do I do next? I worked for a while as an interpreter and as a stage manager, but I knew I needed to have, for want of a better word, a rather old-fashioned word, a vocation. I needed, you know, I need a purpose. Um, and I think that's something that's always been a part of me is this drive. And I think it came from growing up in Easter House and growing up with watching people who fell by the wayside, who didn't have that drive. And I thought, that's easily what could happen to me. It's not going to. So I went into directing. I auditioned for drama school. To be honest, my partner at the time said, you should be a director. I said, why would I be a director? He was an actor. Why would I be a director? And he said, well, you always think you're right. You're always putting people around. You're always, you love the sound of your own voice. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) That seems the list. Okay, that'll work. So I auditioned for drama. I knew I needed training and I auditioned for drama school and much to my surprise, they auditioned 550 people for the directing course. They took six of us and I was one of the six. And that the minute I started that, even at the audition, I knew if I get in here, I don't get in here. This is absolutely the next path of my life. I can't let this pass. You alluded to something there. Your family threw you out because, because oh, you wanted to be a dancer. Well, dancer equaled gay, um, whether I was gay or not gay, and quite clearly gay. Um, I've never had a problem with it. I never came out and never needed to come out. It never, it, I don't know why it never bothered me. I was always very comfortable with it. Uh, but my family weren't. My parents threw me out. So I didn't see them for, for three years. My dad didn't speak to me for 26 years. Um, and curiously, in the last two, two two and a half years of my dad's life, we became wonderful friends, really wonderful friends. But no, it was I was on my own for most of that. They just didn't want to know. Um, yeah, but I, I suppose, that, again, things that like can crush you. But I think it's, I just sort of always had this thing of, it wasn't just driving ambition, it was health. It was mental health. It was wanting a stability. It was wanting purpose in life. It was it was wanting just to, just to be happy, happy, have comfort, have have reason for getting up in the morning. That was what was important.
important to me. I think it's because I saw so much around me as a child of people with no purpose, of people who gave in to alcoholism, who gave in to drugs, who gave in to all sorts of things, and I was pretty much determined never to do it. Um, and that, that was a real drive in me, but it's not like I had any choice. I couldn't go back to mummy and daddy, take my washing and get a, a lovely Sunday dinner. That was never going to happen. I had to work at McDonald's to do that. Do you think that life in, in Easter House in, in Glasgow equipped you with anything? I often think it equipped me with a great bullshit detector, <laughs> you know, bullshit in terms of... And resilience. Great mm-hmm. resilience because basically no matter how many times I've been slapped down, I've always stood up. I've always I've always been determined to get up. And I think you're right with the bullshit detector is I'm I, I can be very suspicious of people's motives for things. Um, but bullshit detector in that I know I think I know what's worth pursuing and what's not. I'm happy to make mistakes, of course, but I kind of detect it quite quite quickly. Um, but yeah, I think the main thing is grit and resilience. And if as I teach a lot these days in various universities, and one of the things I teach is what grit is, and grit's the ability to keep going under circumstances that should be stopping you from doing that. That's grit. It's what, it's what you put on ice and for a car, you put grit down for the wheels. To It's just going to keep slipping, so you put grit down, so you need something to, to fight against. And I think that very much is what I learned uh, in Easter House. It was, it was tough. It was, was not easy. I don't recommend it for anybody. I mean, I wouldn't actively say, oh, you must live in horrible poverty and, and uh, you know, lack of uh, privilege. But then again, at this, by the same token, it was that very thing that made me resilient and has kind of got me, you know, ahead in life and, and made me a happier person in many ways. Do you get back to Scotland or to Glasgow much? No, not at all. Um, I the the basically the only times I've really been back have been for funerals. Um, I had no reason to go back uh, on the work front. Scottish Opera couldn't have cared less what I was doing with my career. Um, they were quite rude many years ago. <laughs> they asked me if I had anything coming up that they could see, and I was like, "Yeah, I've got La Scala. I've got a job in Tokyo." Kennedy Center, um, the Maggio Musicale, uh, where else was the Covent Garden Festival? I think it was various things, and the answer came back, dear Paul, thank you. I think it'd be easy to, you know, be all offended and feel, ooh, how dare they? But my answer just was, well, screw you then. It's fine. Okay. Well, a prophet is never with honour. No, I just thought, well, I think he'll be fine in my business class seat going for the free glass of champagne going to Tokyo. I think that will help me get over this. <laughs> Very good. So where, where is home for you now? Home now is San Francisco. My husband and I live in San Francisco because he is a doctor. He's an eye surgeon. And he's finishing what's called residency. In Britain, I think it's called being a junior doctor. So he will graduate this year as a consultant. Um and we've been there three years. Before that, we were in New York for five years. Yeah, so that that's that's home for now. So you married the doctor, so you have healthcare no, on tap. No, sir. <laughs> I, married, I married a bartender who became a doctor. <laughs> he married an opera director. So you had a bartender on tap. A bartender on tap, <laughs> who's very much more useful for parties than anything else. Yeah. Very good. Okay, well, let's talk a wee bit about health and well-being. But before I give you our famous NHS Five Ways to Wellbeing Challenge, uh, which I know you must be nervous about, what is your experience of healthcare in different parts of the world? Have you, uh, hopefully, you've been keeping well and not needed so well, much? Yeah, of it, but... I've not needed very much, to be honest. Um, and I think, you know, like Mike, as an eye doctor, keeps saying to me, God, for you, Ed, your eyesight's amazing. I'm like, oh, thanks very much for <laughs> reminding me. <laughs> Um, when I, uh, for example, when I went to the American health system is extremely poor. This is terrible. If you don't have insurance, you're lost. One of the things I admire most about Mike and his colleagues is they run a free clinic, an eye clinic for very serious and complicated eye operations for cataracts and all sorts of things. And it's for basically people with no insurance. It's supported by a foundation and part of his, his weekly thing is running this clinic for free. 
90% of his day he spends in Spanish. So that's indicative of the state of health in America. If you don't have health insurance, you're absolutely screwed. I lived, obviously, not only in Britain, but I lived in uh, Norway um, and in Finland at one point, so in Australia. All of them have uh, great uh, welfare systems. Um, and it makes you appreciate it enormously when you move to the States. And literally, you're scrambling not only to pay your rent or whatever, but to say, Christ, I've got to have a bucket load, load of money to just pay for health care in case something goes wrong. Because otherwise, I had an appendectomy two years ago in 2020. Um, it nearly burst. I, I was very lucky. Because the paperwork went wrong, I ended up with a bill. The bill was $75,000. Yes. Uh, thank you. Know, of course, I wasn't having that. I, even in my pain, I remember saying to them, can you make sure you put this through the right channels, etc." And when I spoke to the, the insurance company, eventually, when I got it, I got this wonderful lady who was hilarious. And she sort of asked, she said, so it was an appendectomy. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, who the hell heard of a voluntary appendectomy? She said, it's not like it was improving your waistline, Mr. Kyron, was it? She said, <laughs> I'll be making, I'm sick of this, I'll be making, this is just lazy administration, I'll be making this disappear. And indeed she did. So $75,000 was eaten up by uh, by the insurance. Health-wise, I've, over the past couple of years, and only over the past couple of years, I decided to see a therapist um, for, for just to keep the mental health in balance and See where I am, check in, um, get, you know, ask for help, ask for help when pressure is there. And uh, it's really been fantastic. It's been absolutely wonderful to talk to somebody completely independently with no, no agenda and no real knowledge of your history and just take you at your word. And I find it a very honest place. It's a place where I absolutely will not bullshit um, because it's, mm -hmm. it's the, the best place to, to, to tell that story. Uh, so I think my health is like, I'm, I'm overweight, you know, thanks. This is as we fast approach 60 um, and don't look, look after myself in that way quite as much. But I think my health is actually in a surprisingly good state. My doctor in San Francisco couldn't believe I didn't take any pills. He was shocked because he said, give me a list of your medications. And I said, well, it's nothing. Um, uh, and he did, actually didn't believe me. Because he said, I've never met a man of in their 50s that wasn't on heart medicine and this medicine. Yeah. No. And the need, and the only one I need is, I think it's our the inheritance of our Scottish background, is I need uh, a statin for cholesterol. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all I take. And you won't need vitamin D in the sunshine of California either. So. You won't need vitamin <laughs> D, but you've got to be very, I've got to be super careful to not be in the sun too much otherwise yeah. you have a great risk of uh, uh, skin, cancer. skin cancer so I will not leave the house without factor 50 minimum over my face etc like here in Venice it's very sunny and warm so I only have a 10 minute 5 minute walk to the theatre but I'll be slathering on fast factor 50 before I leave here ok well let's check out where you are health wise okay. uh, with our famous NHS Five Ways to Wellbeing Challenge. Now, normally, my co-presenter Nicola does this with a lot of pizzazz, and all I do is sit and grumble and judge the answers. So <laughs> I'll have to be both showbiz and grumbler uh, uh, in this so regard. So you're exactly like the prologue of Peter Grimes. You are magistrate and judge all at once. <laughs> I am indeed, yes. yes. <laughs> judge and jury. So uh, I've got five questions. If you get three of these answered to my satisfaction... Oh, oh. You win one of our Ways to Wellbeing podcast uh, fridge magnets. Right, now, uh, and I'll, be able, I'll ship that wherever you are in the world. Don't worry. Don't worry. You Thanks won't lose it. Well. Well, it's all to play for. So, first question is, in the past week or so, have you been physically active? Yes. You have to tell me what it is, Paul. Oh, I've, <laughs> I can't so, just accept that and trust. Yes, a lot. I've been walking. I've been walking uh, most days. I'll walk several miles because in Venice, you can't get anywhere without walking. In rehearsal, I put my phone on a pedometer to count the number of steps mm -hmm. I'm taking in, in a, a day's rehearsal, and it's in excess of 20,000. Oh, well, yeah. easily, easily passed that question, right? You've got one You've got one on the scoreboard here. Okay, next question is, um, this is about giving to others and being kind. In the past week, any acts of kindness, any acts of giving to others? Yes. 
Um, I was standing by the Vaporetto the other day going to see friends, and there was a bunch of ladies who were very, very upset because they couldn't work the ticket machine. It was in Italian. They didn't know how to change it into, into English, and the, the card reader wasn't working. So instead of standing watching them, I said, let me help you. So I helped them, and I got them their tickets, and they were very happy. And then the couple behind them said, oh, would you do the same for us? And I, they were Spanish, so I did it for them in Spanish. And then and I missed my boat. And then another couple <laughs> came and said, could you do it for us? <laughs> so I did. Yes, absolutely, I did. Yeah, so, yeah. Right, so uh, the th third question, you've got kindness. That's two on the board there. Third question is about being in the moment, uh, mindfulness, I suppose. Do you practice any kind of mindfulness? Um, because I know, you know, so my rehearsals all the past week have been 72 chorus, all in Italian. It's a little bit like, um, I call it sophisticated babysitting to music because it's a mm -hmm. big group of adults. You've got to keep on top of them. And it's like, it's like working a room of children in many ways. And I don't mean that patronizingly. It's just how groups of people work. But what I'll do is in between rehearsals, I'll find a dressing room or I'll find a part of the stage or whatever where nobody is. The other day I found Peter Grindy's bed and I just lay down and I put a thing over my face and mindfulness, I absolutely have done it for 30 years since I was at drama school. I just lie there for 10 or 15 minutes and I completely relax my body and breathe, shut my eyes, I tune out to everything. My assistant knows not to disturb me. It's only 15 minutes. And when I come out of that, it's like I've just recharged my batteries. So I'm very aware of it because you cannot walk into rehearsal, every rehearsal winding yourself up further and further and further. The, the body simply cannot take it and the mind most certainly cannot take it. So yes, I'm, I practice it every day. Very good. Well, you've already got three points, so the fridge magnet is safe. I might be getting a second fridge magnet, you never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, we don't give two fridge magnets. <laughs> I'm thinking eBay. It's got to be worth something in eBay at some point. You're very demanding. Anyway, <laughs> my last two questions are, in the past week or so, or the past few weeks, have you, are you or have you learnt a new skill in any way? Um, I don't know. I think a little bit because I was paint. I've taken up painting and I was painting the other day and I was not very happy with it. And I was about to throw the remainder of the paints out. And then I just all of a sudden had this idea. And I grabbed the palette knife. And instead of the brushes, I just mm -hmm. grabbed all the extra paint. And I put it in the palette knife and I scraped it up and down the, the painting. In fact, I have proof, sir, one second. A statue of an angel on top it of was, the building. I thought it was the uh, front of a Rolls Royce, but there you are. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> So I learned that, and I just said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So if anything, I mean, if that counts, that would be it. But other than that, no, I've been relying and uh, on the old routine, really. Okay, well, I'm going to give you a point for that, too. So you, oh, you could get a full house here. And my last question, and you cannot count this interview, are you good at connecting with others, with people? Are you, good at connect, are you a good connector with people? My good connector. I speak nine languages. And mm -hmm. I connect with people for a living. So, <laughs> yes. Yes, I am very much. What about, um, what about keeping up with old friends or anything like that? Yeah, in or... fact, this week I just I contacted two friends that live here in Venice. They've lived here since the 90s and deliberately um, uh, connected with them. One thing I've always done in my life and in my career is I'm not the type that takes work home with me. Mm -hmm. I, I very much, you know, the shutters come down and I lock the shutters and I'll I'll leave the rehearsal in the rehearsal room or in the theatre and I will not take the worry of, oh my God, how is this going to work? Because I know there's nothing I can do about it. It can only be fixed the next day. And one of the things I've been very clear on my whole, whole career and what I practice and teach is let it alone, let the paint dry, just let it go and go and meet other people, meet other human beings, relax your mind, have fun, because we do theatre to talk about life. So you have to have a life to talk about. You can't just theorise about it. You can't just let your you know, your brain get all worried about it. So, yes, I do, and I've been in touch, actually. Um, I, I, have, I have a lot of periods where, for example, with Facebook or something like that, 
I'll go off Facebook for two months because it sometimes yeah. it gets a little bit overwhelming. But recently, it's not been Facebook. It's just been contacting folk here that I know in Venice. Yes, so I do. Great. Well, the fridge magnet safe. It's Paul. yours, and it will be winging its way to you. Absolutely. Paul Paul Curran, uh, sought after international man of mystery, <laughs> international Paul man of opera. Spy. <laughs> yes, you have, you have been a terrific guest, and to quote Scottish opera. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Thank and you. and uh hope you have every success with Peter Grimes and uh and whatever you're up to the rest of the year, which I'm sure will be enormously exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Waste to Wellbeing is produced in Inverness, Scotland by Partnerships for Wellbeing, a registered charity. To find out more about our services, go to p4w.org.uk.